Welcome to Magic Arcanum. I'm Ryan Gomez. Behind the scenes is Nicole Burdick, and we're so glad you're here because it's story time. Magic the Gathering has a massive story that connects the game's iconic characters, locations, and events through special spotlight cards. Since their introduction in 2016, we've gotten over 230 such cards, with most standard sets containing just a few, but some have had an uncomfortable amount. As we prepare to open the way and explore the next era of Magic's story in a multiverse connected by Omen Paths, I thought this would be a great time to look back and pick my top 10 favorite spotlight cards to date. And the absolute best of the bunch will get a place of honor within one of my new frame -a jigs These are the framing solution for your collectible cards. With gorgeous solid wood construction and no moving parts, just a magnetic case that offers protection from fingerprints, scratches, even UV light. Cards slot in and out at the top of the frame, which allows you to quickly and easily mix and match. And they're compatible with just about everything, including Pokemon, Magic, Battle Spirit Saga, and you get the idea. The Kickstarter for frame -a jigs is running until June 29th. Use my link below to check it out and order yours today. There are some really vibrant colors waiting to be unlocked as stretch goals, so if you ever wanted to curate your own perfect mini museum of magic, now is your chance. Big thanks to frame -a jigs for sponsoring this video. I'm going to keep them in mind as I look for the perfect story spotlight card to display here in my studio, and I encourage you all to do the same. The very first set to have story spotlight cards was Kaladesh, and among them you'll find my number 10 pick captured by the Consulate. This white enchantment shows us how low the oppressive consulate will go as they capture Pianilar to the delight of Tezzeret. It manages to fit a lot of named characters or agencies into one card, and gameplay-wise, you can use it to turn your opponent's best creature into a hostage, which kind of matches up with what happens in the story. Most Planeswalkers don't have family, at least that we often hear about, so bringing us to Chandra's birthplace and making the story mostly about her mother was a nice way to mix things up and establish how spotlight cards could be used to, well, spotlight supporting characters. My number nine favorite takes us to Theros, when Elspeth went beyond death and escaped her own fate. Calyx was created to chase her down, as seen in the spotlight card, Relentless Pursuit. Theros Beyond Death suffered the awkward absence of a written story, and so the spotlights had to do a lot to introduce new characters, like Calyx, and tell us what they wanted and what they were willing to do to get it. This green sorcery could be played in a deck along with the new Planeswalker himself, and even though it only finds lands and creatures from among the top four cards of your deck, that's not a problem when you've got an abundance of creatures that are also enchantments to work with Calyx. Over on Dominaria, we find my number eight spotlight, which is Temporary Lockdown. The Phyrexians have once again come to the plane and are making great use of their sleeper agents to infiltrate and destabilize the Coalition forces on a large scale. But this chapter of the story has a much more intimate focus, as a small group of allies are locked in a tower with a single Phyrexian threat. It's a tense moment that reminds me of The Thing, and the card's art captures that claustrophobic feeling you'd get from being sealed inside a building with something terrible lurking in the shadows. Favorite spotlight number seven is the Elder Spell from the massive War of the Spark storyline. That set had almost 30 spotlight cards, and I really loved the scale of this whole event. You've got planeswalkers drawn from all corners of the multiverse, held against their will so that their sparks can be harvested by Nicol Bolas and his army of Eternals. It was hard to limit myself to just one pick here, but I went with the Elder Spell because it is as brutal as a card as it was in the story. For just two mana, you don't remove one Planeswalker, but any number of them, 
and add to the loyalty of one of your own. Being a sorcery makes it a little slow, I admit, but I'm amazed this card sees almost no play in constructed formats, given how powerful it can be. I mean, Oathbreaker is an officially recognized format now, and this seems like a perfect flavor fit for a Nicol Bolas Dragon God deck. Destroy their Planeswalkers and get yourself that much closer to resolving a game-winning ultimate. Or you step on the rake that is Jace's third counterspell. Anyway, for number six, it is off to Kaldheim, where Tricky Tybalt has opened the Omen Paths. Not to be confused with the Omen Paths dotting the landscape of the multiverse now. No, these Omen Paths had a more specific and sinister focus. You see, Tybalt stole the Tyrite Sword and used it to slice his way across the various realms of Kaldheim, intending to trigger a Doomscar before being stopped by Kaya and Tyvar. Open the Omen Paths captures the danger of Tybalt's actions with this swirling, unsettling ring of serpents, and the devilish planeswalker is standing at the center, cradling his stolen magical sword, delighted to see the rip in the sky forming before him. Gameplay-wise, this card offers two seemingly harmless options, but they are deceptively powerful. Turning three mana into four can allow you to jump ahead on the board, or, if you're already ahead there, Giving your team plus one power can be just enough to ruin combat math for your opponent. It was a moment where Tybalt started to change the fate of a whole plane, and the card could change the direction of a whole game, which is why I really like this one. Fifth place takes us back to Ravnica and the War of the Spark, to the moment Gideon sacrificed himself to save fellow Gatewatch member Liliana. This would go on to shape Liliana's character development for years, and the loss of Gideon would also greatly affect Chandra, Nyssa, and Jace as they struggled to find their way without a group leader. It's a bit cheesy in the friendship defeats true evil kind of way, but it's a great representation of White's philosophy within the color pie, and I like how the card mirrors the story by letting you throw all of your lethal damage onto one creature or planeswalker, allowing you to live to see another day. Urza's Silex is my number four favorite spotlight card. This supremely powerful magical artifact has been represented a few times in the game's history, but this version from the Brothers War most closely matches with what we're told it can do in the story. It will wipe the land clear, leaving everyone with just a few scant resources remaining, and you can even use it to ignite the spark of a planeswalker hiding somewhere in your deck and bring them to your hand. It's named after one of the game's most iconic characters, and using it echoes one of the most destructive events they were ever involved in. That's a lot of flavor packed into three colorless mana. My next favorite spotlight card almost feels like cheating because it's really two cards, not one, and that's Extus and Awaken the Blood Avatar. Extus was the main villain of the Strixhaven set. He was a former student of the school who became obsessed with destroying it and decided to awaken an ancient evil and unleash it on the unsuspecting campus. So we get a card with both. The front half is Extus as a legendary creature with a pretty strong magecraft trigger that gets your defeated creatures back from the graveyard, and the back side is a sorcery that is cheaper to cast the more you're willing to sacrifice. The blood avatar token it creates is also pretty cool as a 3-6 that does an additional 3 damage to each opponent when it attacks. Magic has had double-faced cards for a while now, and technically Ixalan had the first spotlight card to use this technology, but I like this one better because it gives us a new legendary creature and shows us what they're after in the story, while letting us pick where we want to jump in on that narrative arc. And I gotta say, this one looks great in a frame of a jig because it's double-sided, and so is the frame, which means you can enjoy the whole story anytime you like. The number two spot goes to Hour of Devastation, a card that carries the name of its own set and 
accurately represents what happens to the Gatewatch when they go up against Nicol Bolas on his home turf. A board wipe that calls out non-Bolas planeswalkers? It even removes indestructible, so it works against gods that dare stand in your way? This is one of my favorite cards in my Amonkhet themed commander deck, where it performs vital gameplay functions while being a celebration of the Elder Dragon we all know and love. And that brings me to my number one pick from among story spotlights, Broken Bond from Dominaria. Ryan Yi is my favorite magic artist, and while his portfolio might not be as big as some others, every one of his pieces has this ethereal quality to it that draws me right in. Broken Bond is no different. Nyssa is feeling terrible, having just suffered a crushing defeat at the hands of Nicol Bolas, but also she was lied to by Liliana, who she thought was her friend. This betrayal forces her to re-evaluate what's important to her, and she decides to leave the Gatewatch and return home to Zendikar, where she'll feel appreciated and certainly won't be hurt by her allies again. There are a lot of subtle mechanical underpinnings to this card. It destroys artifacts or enchantments, which is iconic to Green's position in the color pie, and it matches Nyssa's desire to do away with artifice in that moment of the story. She wants to return to something real and trustworthy. Then we've got the ability to put a land into play, which enables Landfall, the signature mechanic of Zendikar, where Nyssa intends to go. This reminds us that she's not changing as a character so much as her outlook on the rest of the world is being influenced by what she just experienced on Amonkhet. Oftentimes in superhero stories, the good guys never lose. And even when they do, they usually bounce right back, ready to try again. So to see the Gatewatch not only suffer a loss against Nicol Bolas, but to then see that have a ripple effect across the team itself was actually pretty cool. Of course Nyssa would be upset with Liliana, and of course she would rather return home than help chase down yet another demon here on Dominaria. She was done being exploited, and she wisely separated herself from the team, even if it ended up being temporary. It was a bold moment for the story, featuring a character I have really enjoyed seeing grow over the years, illustrated by my favorite artist in the game. That makes it my number one Story Spotlight card, and the perfect one to slot into a frame of a jig and proudly display here in the Arcanum Studio. Remember, you've got until June 29 to join the Kickstarter using my link down below and order these for yourself. They're a great way to show off your favorite cards from your favorite games, and I would love to hear what you're planning to put in yours. Maybe you have a legend you want to display, or a series of basic lands from a plane you wish you could visit, or something signed by your favorite content creator. Let me know down in the comments, and then make sure you like this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the great stories you'll only find here on Magic Arcanum. We'll see ya!